I don't know where to start. I only hope this will give you some closure. I never wanted this to happen. I've always been a caring person, but this is my darkest moment. I don't accept you to forgive me for what happened, so I won't ask for your forgiveness. I do need you to know that I am so sorry this happened. If I could give my own life to get hers back, I would. I will carry this with me for the rest of my life. In 2015, in Canada, civil police officer Catherine Campbell decided to start her weekend off by going to a bar with friends. She left home on Friday night, but by Monday she hadn't shown up for work. Her co-workers began an investigation, but sadly it was too late. She was found lifeless. A potential suspect was captured. The case gained national attention due to the brutality of the evidence and the defence's controversial strategy. The defence attempted to shift the blame onto Catherine herself, aiming to absolve the guilt of the accused, Christopher Garnier. Catherine Campbell was born in January 1979 in the maritime province of Nova Scotia, Canada. She was the middle daughter of Susan and Dwight Campbell. From a young age, Catherine exhibited a natural aptitude for helping people and serving her community. She was known for being affectionate, helpful and supportive. She followed in her father's footsteps and became a firefighter at a young age. She later transitioned to a career as a police officer, a profession she practiced with determination and commitment. On Friday, September 11th, 2015, at the age of 36, Catherine ended her working day as usual, bid her colleagues goodbye and wished them a good weekend. She was scheduled to be off for the weekend and would only return to work on Monday. However, when Monday came, she did not show up and failed to make any contact to explain her absence. She was a very responsible police officer and had never been absent from work without a proper justification. Colleagues attempted to reach her by phone but received no response. After several hours of failed attempts, police department officials grew concerned and a team was assigned to go to her apartment to investigate. Upon arriving at Catherine's property, the police called out, but no one answered. However, they found the door was unlocked and entered. They discovered that she was not there. The apartment was in normal condition, organised, clean and everything in its place. The only unusual aspects were the TV being on and the alarm clock ringing. Some personal belongings, such as her keys, wallet and cell phone, were missing. The police requested footage from the building's security cameras to determine when she had left and whether she was alone or accompanied. When analysing the images, the footage revealed that she left shortly after midnight on Friday, got into a taxi alone and never returned. Alarmed, the police realised they were facing a serious situation and they would need to act as quickly as possible to find her. It was discovered that Catherine had decided to go out for drinks and fun with friends in the city centre, and she had taken a taxi as she obviously would not drive back. The images from the building's camera circuit led the police to identify the taxi driver, who confirmed in a statement that he had picked her up and had taken her to a bar called Ale House. According to him, her behaviour seemed normal and calm, without any indication of drunkenness or drug use. Ale House is an intimate bar with live music. It is frequented by groups of friends, co-workers at happy hour and even families. It isn't styled like a nightclub, rather it's a place to sit, chat and relax. Security cameras recorded that Catherine began talking to a man at one point, they had a few drinks and became more intimate, eventually kissing and dancing sensually. Their behaviour escalated to the point where a staff member had to ask them to take it easy as some customers were feeling uncomfortable. 
Shortly afterwards, at around 3 a.m., Catherine and her companion left the place and got into a taxi. Her companion was Christopher Garnier, a 27-year-old former paramedic who was easily recognised by the staff as he had previously worked at Alehouse. In his testimony, a bartender and former colleague of Christopher's stated that Christopher had recently ended a long-term relationship with his girlfriend, Brittany Francis. Following the breakup, Brittany had kicked him out of their shared apartment, forcing him to return to his parents' house in another city. In the meantime, he had asked a friend named Mitchell DeVos for temporary accommodation. Mitchell told the police that on Friday night, he and Christopher drank heavily before deciding to continue their night out at a bar near Alehouse, where they stayed for about an hour. It turned out that Mitchell got very drunk, prompting the bar to stop selling alcohol to them. A police patrol was called, and Mitchell was taken to the Drunk Tank, a Canadian police service that provides a safe place for intoxicated individuals to sleep and hydrate before being released the next day. After his friend went to the Drunk Tank, Christopher, who was not excessively drunk, decided to go to the ale house to continue his night out. It was there that he met Catherine, and as previously mentioned, they left together in a taxi. The taxi driver, a different individual, provided the destination address, and the police ended up going back to Mitchell's house. Security cameras recorded the couple arriving at the apartment at around 3.30 a.m. After that, there was no further record of Catherine leaving the premises. Based on these findings, Christopher became the main suspect in the case and was subsequently tracked by police officers. The police were able to ascertain that he had resumed his relationship with his girlfriend, returned to live in his old apartment with her, and continued his daily routine during the days following Catherine's disappearance. Mitchell was called in again to provide additional information after his release from the social shelter service. He reported that upon returning home on Saturday morning, he found Christopher sleeping on the sofa bed in the living room. He was surprised to see that Christopher was not using the blanket he had lent him. The police collected an exchange of messages between the two friends, where Mitchell asked about the blanket. Christopher replied that he had to throw it away after getting sick from drinking and soiling it, as he couldn't make it to the bathroom in time. He assured Mitchell that he was already arranging for a new blanket, as the old one was too damaged. Investigators began searching the apartment for evidence and identified traces of blood on the living room floor, the sofa bed and other objects in the living room and bathroom. Later, experts confirmed that the blood samples belonged to Catherine. Additionally, security cameras from several commercial establishments on Mitchell Street revealed something unsettling. In the early hours of September 12th, around 5am, Christopher was seen leaving the back of the building, and about a minute later, he returned to the building carrying a trash can. A few minutes later, he exited the building again with the trash can, but this time, he appeared to struggle with it, seemingly due to its weight. At one point, it was possible to see that he dropped something, stopped, retrieved and placed it back in the trash and continued his journey. In addition to the recorded footage, several witnesses testified to seeing and following the strange movements of this unknown man in the neighbourhood. They observed him dragging a trash can in the early hours of the morning, heading towards MacDonald Bridge, which was about five minutes away. The bridge's cameras also captured Christopher dragging the trash can for a considerable distance. On September 16th, 2015, a few days after Catherine's disappearance, the police conducted a thorough search of the area surrounding the MacDonald Bridge. Directly beneath the bridge, they discovered a green trash can, seemingly thrown from above. When they opened the can, their worst fears were confirmed. 
Inside was the body of 36-year-old Catherine Campbell. She was dressed but missing her panties and bra. Mitchell's blanket was not found at the scene and remains missing to this day. Next to the can was a trash bag containing a gym access card and a set of keys, later identified as belonging to the gym she attended and her personal car. The coroner determined that Catherine died from suffocation and had sustained blunt force injuries to her head, bruises on her eye which were consistent with punches, as well as other various marks of aggression spread across her body. Additionally, her nose had been fractured. That same day, just an hour after the discovery, Christopher was arrested inside his car, allegedly heading towards McDonald Bridge. In the back seat of the car, officers found a large piece of green tarp, gloves, a yellow rope, duct tape, a gallon of gasoline, a brown blanket and a backpack containing clothes, hygiene items and his passport. The police believed that Christopher planned to permanently dispose of Catherine's body and then, if necessary, flee the country. In custody at the police station, Christopher was interrogated for more than nine hours. His ex-girlfriend, who had resumed their relationship on September 12th, the day after Catherine disappeared, was present the entire time. Throughout the interrogation, Christopher mostly cried and claimed he couldn't remember much about the night he met Catherine. Tell me that she wasn't still alive when she was put in that, when she was put in that dump, that compost bin. Was she still alive when she was put in that compost bin? No. She didn't suffer in there? She didn't suffer when you threw her down over that bank? She was dead? How do you know she was dead? I think she was. How do you know that? How do you know that? Did you tell me that she was not alive when you stuffed her in there? How do you know that she wasn't alive? She wasn't moving. You're a paramedic. How do you know that she was not alive? She wasn't breathing. She wasn't breathing? Like, how do you know that? Did you get down? Did you feel close to her face? You know, because some people, you, you know, you're a paramedic. You can get down close to somebody and they might have faint breaths. I don't know. You put her in there. She wasn't alive. 100% you know that? You tell me 100% that she wasn't alive? I think. Did she suffer, Chris? I don't think. How do you know she didn't suffer? I don't know. Chris, how did it, how, how, how do you know that you think it was over quick? You're a paramedic, you're a firefighter, you know, you know, anatomy, you know how people, people's bodies work. She wasn't moving, but she wasn't breathing. I appreciate you being honest. I appreciate you being honest with me, and, I, and, and I'm glad that I'm not glad of the outcome, but I'm glad that she wasn't suffering inside of the compost bin for however long. After hours of not providing any relevant information, Christopher finally confessed to the crime. The evidence presented to him was robust and unquestionable, clearly incriminating him. However, his version of events was controversial. He claimed that when they arrived at the apartment, Catherine asked him to engage in rough sex. She allegedly requested that he slap her, punch her and squeeze her throat. According to him, they both participated in consensual violent sex, but at some point she lost consciousness and passed out. He said he became desperate trying to revive her until he experienced a mental blackout and couldn't remember anything that happened afterwards. Minutes later, Christopher is left alone in the interrogation room and he wrote a confession letter. I don't know where to start. I only hope this will give you some closure. 
I never wanted this to happen. I've always been a caring person, but this is my darkest moment. I don't accept you to forgive me for what happened, so I won't ask for your forgiveness. I do need you to know that I am so sorry this happened. If I could give my own life to get hers back, I would. I will carry this with me for the rest of my life. Based on this letter, Christopher was detained at the police station. A few days later, after paying bail in the amount of $100,000, he was released to serve house arrest until his trial in court. The trial began in November 2017, more than two years after the crime occurred and lasted just five weeks. Christopher was indicted on two charges, intentional homicide with aggravated circumstances and undue interference with the victim's body. He pleaded not guilty to both charges, claiming that his confession during the police interrogation was coerced and that he had been manipulated into telling detectives what they wanted to hear. His defence strategy was to portray Catherine's death as a tragic accident rather than a crime. The defence argued that Catherine had requested rough sex, asking Christopher to hit her and squeeze her neck in a practice known as erotic asphyxiation. Christopher claimed that being inexperienced with this type of sexual practice, he did not know how to control the intensity and duration, leading to the situation spiralling out of control until Catherine fainted. He then went to the bathroom to get water to throw at her, and when he came back he saw that she was no longer breathing. He tried to revive her, and then the mental blackout occurred. From that point on, he claimed he couldn't remember anything. Christopher himself was called to testify. He stated that, although his memories of that night were confused and fragmented, he remembered Catherine asking to engage in dominance and submission practices and that the act of choking her lasted about 30 seconds. Anticipating the backlash, he would face blaming the victim who could not defend herself. Christopher declared, I'm not trying to blame Catherine. She was nice to me that night. The fact that she wanted to do this doesn't make her a bad person. The defence also called another witness, a man with whom Catherine had two sexual encounters just weeks before she died. He reported that during their second and final meeting, Catherine asked him to put his hands on her neck and squeeze lightly. However, she did not ask him to punch or slap her. This testimony suggested that she was interested in some form of violent sexual activity. Additionally, other intimate details of Catherine's sexual life were exposed, causing turmoil and outrage in the court, as it was seen as an attempt to blame Catherine for her own death. Another controversial witness presented by the defence was Christopher's girlfriend, Brittany Francis. She had been by his side throughout the process since they got back together the day after Catherine was killed. Brittany wrote a request for leniency to the judge, aiming to sway the jury to reduce Christopher's sentence. In the letter, she stated, I consider myself incredibly lucky to call Christopher my significant other. He truly is the best kind of person inside and out. He saved me from me and has given me something to look forward to for the future. Our future. I love him more today than I ever have. The prosecution's thesis was that Christopher had been involved in a violent physical altercation with the victim, for whatever reason, and applied disproportionate force leading to her death. He then attempted to dispose of the body, transporting it in a trash can to throw it in the woods below the McDonald Bridge. A medical expert testified about the condition of the body, indicating that the marks found were not consistent with consensual violent sexual activity. The prosecution presented all footage of Christopher carrying the trash can, along with eyewitness statements. 
Excerpts from Christopher's initial police statement, where he confessed to the crime, were also shown to reinforce his guilt. On the final day of the trial, during the closing arguments, the defence lawyer urged the jury to acquit Christopher. He argued that there was no evidence to support the case presented by the prosecution, in which Christopher had simply lost control during a fight. The defence did not dispute the video footage evidence, but pointed out that there is an interval of approximately 45 minutes without footage recorded, and that it was exactly during that period that the fatality would have occurred. In short, for the defence, the death was an unintentional act. The prosecution began their closing arguments by asserting that Catherine's death was not merely unintentional. They maintained that Christopher had choked her to death and reminded the jury that he had attempted to dispose of her body as if he were throwing out the trash. The prosecution expressed outrage at the defence's strategy of blaming the victim despite the overwhelming evidence. The prosecutor emphasised that it takes approximately two minutes of uninterrupted strangulation to fatally suffocate someone, and that Catherine had remained motionless and silent for those two long minutes, highlighting the deliberate nature of the act. After five hours of deliberation, the jury reached its verdict. Christopher Garnier was found guilty. At 30 years old, he was sentenced to life in prison, with the right to a parole hearing after serving a minimum sentence of 13 years. The conviction caused a significant emotional response in the courtroom. The Garnier family and Christopher's girlfriend wept, expressing their dissatisfaction with the life sentence and indicating their intention to appeal against the decision. Meanwhile, the Campbell family cried tears of relief and joy, celebrating the fact that, after more than two years, they had finally achieved justice for Catherine. We express our deepest sympathies to the victim's family. If you've made it this far, please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to this channel. Also, add your opinion in our comments. Thank you very much. I will see you in the next case.